Well, hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and um, thank you guys very much uh, to the pathology residents at Yale for inviting me to um, give grand rounds today and also to share some cases with you. So I've given you uh, eight unknowns here today to look at, and I have to say before we even get started that um, I don't know if I've ever seen residents preview the cases so extensively. Look at this, 164 reviews of this case. That's pretty impressive. Like you guys were like, were, you guys were hustling to look at these things. So I'm excited to see um, uh, how, how things go. And feel free to interrupt or ask questions at any time if you have, uh, have any, okay? So let's do um, case number one, a 35-year-old woman with a vulvar mass. And on CT scan, it's a 15-centimeter soft tissue mass going from, from beneath the vulva down into the underlying perivaginal pelvic soft tissue. And there are several slides here I posted. Um, so let's see uh, what you guys thought about this. Let's look at the first one. Okay, big big slabs of tissue here. Who uh, who wants to take this? And you don't have to describe, you can just say what you thought or or what your differential is or what stains you'd want, whatever you like. I can try. So I think this uh, overall looks like a hypocellular lesion with mixoid background with abundant vessels. Uh, the cells looks quite uh, bland looking with no mitosis. Uh, based on the location, I think the differential diagnosis could include the aggressive angiomyxoma. Uh, others include some um, angiomyofibroblastoma. Very good. Yeah, that's the the question that always comes up is we get a bland spindle cell tumor in the um, the uh, anogenital region or the the genital region. Um, particularly in women, but also men too sometimes. And, and then we wonder, is it, it's one of those weird benign genital stromal tumors. And these tumors can be challenging because they have a lot of overlapping features and they all occur in the same site. And immunostains, depending on the case, can like have a good bit of overlap. And so, um, so people have a good bit of angst about, about these tumors. But you correctly identified this is actually what used to be called aggressive angiomyxoma. But the other name I think that's more preferred now is deep angiomyxoma. And I like that term. And when I was Dr. Weiss's fellow, she she was a big fan of that too. She said, you know, the thing is, Jared, that these, these lesions are, are called aggressive because they can recur and they are large and infiltrative, but they're not they're not like rapidly growing, you know, malignant behavior aggressive. They just can grow back sometimes because they're big and they infiltrate the pelvic soft tissue and therefore they're hard to remove. Okay. It's hard to get the entire thing out because uh, they can infiltrate into the fat like you're seeing here. And so because of that, they can be hard to remove. Now, I think one thing I struggle with about angiomyxoma is there's not like any one single feature that makes the diagnosis to me. It's kind of a constellation of features. Um, and I feel like when you have um, uh, entities like that, it can be a little bit harder to learn. And also they're relatively rare. Um, I've only seen a handful of them. And so this is, I think, the very best example that I've seen probably. All right. I will point out one thing before we go any farther is even though the name is angiomyxoma, to me, myxoid stuff is like blue, right? Like really blue, like myxofibrosarcoma. The examples of this entity that I've seen and many of the pictures I've seen don't really look that blue. It looks more to me, to my eye, like edema almost. It's pink collagen. So there's a kind of a fine collagen background with a lot of extra substance. And I'm sure that there must be some myxoid there, but it often has this kind of pale look, not quite so blue as like a true like myxoid thing. So I feel like that the name sometimes makes you imagine it should have a bunch of, of myxoid, but to me, there's often kind of an edema sort of look. So let's first talk about the, the angio part, the vessels, okay? The one key about the vessels is they range in size a lot. They can go from really small, tiny vessels all the way up to big, thick-walled muscular vessels. And we see that here. Here's a thick-walled muscular vessel with some intimal uh, hyperplasia or intimal reactive change. Here we've got vessels that are a bit smaller of varying size and shape. And then all the way down to little tiny, you know, capillary sized vessels or venules, little small, very delicate vessels. OK, so there, there's a wide range of, of that. There's a lot of vascularity and it ranges a lot in size and shape. I think that's one really helpful feature. OK, number two, like I said, the background tends to be this kind of pale, edematous sort of looking myxoid and it has very fine collagen. See these little thin wisps of collagen? That's pretty characteristic, I think. 
all right? These cells are relatively nondescript. They're kind of uh, spindle to stellate um, uh, in appearance. They can have kind of round to oval nuclei, and they're very sparse, um, hypocellular. Um, you can sometimes get slightly more cellular areas, but um, usually they're kind of low cellularity like this, all right? So all of those features together are a characteristic of a deep or formerly known as aggressive angiomyxoma. Oh wait, there's one other thing I wanted to point out. And this is a, a little pearl that, um, that I learned from my mentor, Mark Edgar, who is another, another soft tissue pathology mentor who taught me lots of really great little visual, uh, you know, subtle clues about soft tissue tumors. And he said that what you often see, and it's been described by others, but what you often see are these little thin wisps or small thin fascicles of, of pink spindle cells that look like little smooth muscle bundles. I think that's probably what they are. They're little wisps of smooth muscle that kind of stretch out across the background. And a lot of times you'll see them kind of uh, coming, arising off the edge of a vessel. Kind of, we can get that here. Let's get it in focus. And you can kind of see this little wisp of muscle right around the vessel. And then they kind of spin off and swirl out into the background of the tumor. And I do find that to be um, relatively useful characteristic finding. Ah, here it is uh, right here. And there's this nice uh, thin wisp of pink spindled cells spinning, kind of swirling out into the, the loose uh, background here. And now this, this tumor is of interest because uh, Dr. Laskin, one of your amazing faculty, uh, wrote one of the seminal papers about this entity, actually. And uh, he's, he's published, uh, in fact, about multiple entities that we're going to look at today. So I know he's uh, here in the audience. He said he may skip out for some frozen sections or something. So it's always a little bit nerve wracking when the person who like described an entity is sitting in the audience when you're giving a lecture. So uh, hopefully I don't make any uh, huge uh, faux pas. If so, we'll, we'll find out later. Uh, I did put a couple slides in, even though you don't need to see all of them, just because it's a, such an uncommon entity. And um, I also wanted to highlight the variability in pattern, right? This is all from the same tumor. And you can see there's areas with fat, there's areas with a bit more collagen, there's areas that are a bit more mixoid. Um, and uh, so that variability is good to know about because uh, that can sometimes be uh, can, can create a challenge. I think this last one is also really nice because look, look, this, this piece here is super vascular, tons of blood vessels, looks quite different from that first, uh, first slide I showed you. And then here on the same, the same slide, another piece of tissue from the tumor, much more edematous and mixoid. And also this is a feature you sometimes see is you can see hemorrhage um, in the, uh, the background of the tumor. There can be extravasated erythrocytes, and that's a feature you can see in a variety of different mixoid tumors, things that have a lot of mixoid change, sometimes get hemorrhage from the vessels. And again, look at those little wisps of smooth muscle. So immunostains, I feel like this is really mostly an H&E diagnosis, but if you want to do immunostains, usually Desmond is going to be expressed um, a lot of times in these. And like for the majority of the, the genital stromal tumors, uh, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor are usually positive. There is more recently a molecular finding. HMGA2 is a gene that has rearrangements in, a, in not all of, the, of these, but in a subset of deep angiomyxomas, you can have HMGA2 rearrangements. So in a difficult case, that could be uh, useful. But I think the thing is, I see, I see when I've looked at consult cases, I feel like people often send um, any genital spindle cell thing they see, if it's got any edema or mixoid change, they have a tendency to be worried about aggressive angiomyxoma because of that name, I think, because of the aggressiveness. And they often often get sent in for consult. So, you know, uh, large skin tags or, you know, acrocordons or also known as fibroepithelial polyps um, in the general area can get a lot of edema in them and, or, or some mixoid change. And so sometimes people will send those in. Sometimes you can have superficial angiomyxoma, which is also known as cutaneous myxoma. Those uh, sometimes occur in the vulva in the genital region, but they're small and superficial. So I think that's the, the most helpful thing to me, aside from all the features we just talked about, is if the thing, if the mass is two centimeters and in the subcutis or the dermis, it's probably not a deep angiomyxoma. They are, these are usually large, deep masses that infiltrate into the pelvic soft tissue. And again, that's why they're uh, potentially problematic. And then let me show you um, 
a, uh, an example just for, for contrast. This is a cutaneous myxoma, which is basically synonymous with superficial angiomyxoma. To me, aside from the fact that this is a small circumscribed subcutaneous nodule, they look relatively different. They have they have very thin, delicate branching vessels, you know, almost a little bit like the chicken wire vessels that you can see in a myxoid liposarcoma. These very delicate, subtle vessels, not the wide range of thick, thin, and medium-sized vessels that you see in, in the deep angiomyxoma. And also, I feel like there's usually a much more blue, abundant myxoid background um, in these cutaneous or superficial angiomyxoma. And um, sometimes they have a scattering of neutrophils. I have um, a video about this on my YouTube channel uh, that you can go and check out if you need a review of this entity. So that's just to show you a contrast of what a superficial angiomyxoma would look like um, so that you don't get those confused. Okay, any questions about that one before we move on to case two? All right. You guys still hear me okay? You're still, you're still with me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, case two is a 50-year-old man with a two-centimeter inguinal mass. If only we always got histories and info uh, with, you know, the actual size and all that stuff, but sometimes we don't, but I wanted to give you guys some classic, you know, info. All right, so let's take a look at uh, this one. Uh, who, wants to, who wants to take this? I can take it. So we have a vascular-looking lesion. Uh, there's also spindle cells present but they look fairly bland, not real, no real increase in mitoses. Uh, kind of has some areas that are more open and edematous than others, whereas mm -hmm. others appear a bit more dense. Uh, maybe a little bit of inflammation present and maybe an area or two of some entrapped adipose tissue. Yeah. So Good. I was thinking along the lines of a cellular angiofibroma, but also considered sort of like a fat pore spindle cell lipoma or maybe even an SFT. Wow, what a rock star. Fantastic. Yes, um, that is an, an amazing differential. Uh, who, who was this? Who, who answered that one? I, my little window has disappeared. Uh, I'm Peter, one of the first years. Okay, you're a first year. Man, that's fantastic. Well done, sir. Well done. Yeah, that's a perfect differential is, is there's a little bit of fat here. And, um, uh, but, but we have a lot of uh, bland spindle cells with abundant kind of bundles of collagen in the background, kind of ropey collagen. Look at that waviness. That waviness, it often makes people think of neural things, right? But you know, nerve usually, it, it, nerve can be a little bit wavy, but not dramatically so. I also find that fibroblastic entities usually actually are much more wavy than neural things. And I've got a little a video about that. It's, I, I refer to that as the ramen noodle sign. Uh, one of my um, former uh, fellows, uh, Ed Fulton, came up with that idea that, that collagen gets really wavy in dense regular connective tissue and a lot of fibroblastic tumors do the same thing. So when you think you have a neural tumor and S100 is negative, always think of fibroblastic things, particularly spindle cell lipoma and related entities. So this, like you said, this is actually a cellular angiofibroma and um, it is probably closely related to spindle cell lipoma. And because of that, it has a lot of similar features. So I feel like it's an entity, there are several entities we'll talk about today that are related to spindle cell lipoma probably and may exist kind of in a, in a loosely knit family. And so you can learn multiple entities for the price of one because they have overlapping features and they're all benign and they have similar immunohistochemical findings, all right? So yes, fat is often present in cellular angiofibroma. So when I see something that looks kind of like spindle cell lipoma, but it's in the genitals, it's probably a cellular angiofibroma. They do, as the name implies, tend to have a lot of vessels and the vessels can be these kind of staghorn ectatic branching vessels, which make it resemble solitary fibrous tumor. And these cellular angiofibroma, just like SFT and just like spindle cell lipoma, they're usually CD34 positive. Sometimes they can express um, some actin and desmin as well. And you know, one thing I think is a pretty helpful for, for this entity and also for spindle cell lipoma and other related entities is this uh, packeting or parallel arrays is what Dr. Weiss liked to say, or to me, they're kind of like palisades, right? The nuclei kind of line up in, in a little row together. And you can see as you look around these little clumps and groups 
of the bland spindle cells clumped together and then in between there are zones of hypocellularity. It's not like the beautiful palisades that you'd see like in a schwannoma, like in a varicae body, but it's kind of this subtle palisading. And sometimes it's very nice and, and real pretty like this here. Other times it's very, very subtle and I have to convince my residents and fellows, they're like, really, that's not palisading. So, you know, we do have to kind of hallucinate a little bit sometimes in pathology to, to see the subtleties. But I do think that finding subtle palisading in a spindle cell tumor is really useful and it right away makes me think of spindle cell lipoma, cellular angiofibroma, and other entities. And just like spindle cell lipoma, look, mast cells, often scattered mast cells in the background. You can have some myxoid change. What's the um, more recently described immunostain marker that, that um, is uh, potentially helpful here in sorting this out from some other entities? Loss of RB1. Yeah, RB1, exactly. The retinoblastoma gene um, is often lost in, um, in spindle cell lipoma and um, in cellular angiofibroma and other entities. And so you can do fish for that. It'll show like monosomy. It'll show a single copy of RB1. Or you can do the immunostain, which will show loss of RB1 in the majority of the lesional cells. And that's, a, that's not in 100%, but it's in the majority of this entity. And this is another entity that Dr. Laskin published about um, and under the name of angiomyofibroblastoma-like tumor of the male genital tract. And for a while, there was a thought that maybe these tumors were, were more common in men. But over time, as we've looked at the, these, we, um, we've recognized that they can occur in both sexes, both men and women, in the genital region usually. And, um, and that they probably, um, the, the entity that Dr. Laskin described, uh, now people refer to as cellular angiofibroma. And I think most people will see if Dr. Laskin agrees, but that they, they probably represent the same thing. And so what if you called this a spindle cell lipoma instead of cellular angiofibroma? nothing bad would happen. It wouldn't matter because they're both benign. They're usually cured by simple excision. So don't don't worry about making that distinction. Basically, if I think it's a spittle cell lipoma, but it's in the genitals, I'm going to call it cellular angiofibroma. I don't know if that's right, but that's the way that I approach them personally. So, um, and for SFT, the marker that you could do if you were having concern there would be STAT6, which is going to be positive. And RB1, to my knowledge, is not lost in solitary fibrous tumor. And that can sometimes be important because occasionally SFTs can, uh, can have atypical features that might give a little bit different um, need for management. And, um, but when, they, when they're, uh, you know, that's a kind of a more complicated topic for another day. But making that distinction can be important. So the nice example of a cellular angiofibroma, and I like to say of the genitals, because um, there are like six different things, I think, in soft tissue pathology named angiofibroma. It's getting like a little bit crazy. Um, and it, it's no wonder why people find soft tissue pathology hard, because all the names just take like lipo, mixo, fibro, angio, and like combine them together in any different way. And you can make all these totally different tumors that have very similar sounding names. So it's a, it's a touch maddening. And um, here's the, again, that nice palisading, bland spindle cells, slightly wavy, some thick bundles of ropey collagen, cellular angiofibroma of the genitals. Very nice. All right. Okay, case three. A 60-year-old man with a two-centimeter breast mass. I can take this one. Okay. Um, my name is Morgan Harones. Um, I'm a first year. So what I'm seeing here is um, a well circumscribed kind of a un unencapsulated um, subcutaneous um, um, type of mass. Mm -hmm. um, it's composed of um, variable, uh, variably sized fascicles. Um, on higher power, if you look closer, you see these like characteristic bundles of really um, thick, coarse collagen. They're yeah. really prominent. Um, and then um, on higher power as you are, um, you see these uh, bland spindle cells. Um, they're variably sized, um, but very rare atypia. They look pretty bland. Um, they, they kind of show some areas of palisading, but um, it's not, I mean, completely uh, uniform in dramatic. Um, so I was thinking with this picture with these really thick coarse bundles of collagen, um, uh, mammary type myofibroblastoma. What a rock star, man. I love you guys. First year stepping up to the plate and nailing like really hard, you know, kind of esoteric soft tissue tumors. Well done. That's really great. 
Um, yeah, this is a great, real classic example, I think, of a mammary type myofibroblastoma. And I agree with you that these, these very thick bundles of ropey collagen dividing the fascicles, uh, clumps and clusters of bland spindle cells is a pretty helpful feature. And again, this is one of those other entities that's in the, the kind of RB1 loss group. It tends to have RB1 loss. It has a lot of features overlapping with spindle cell lipoma. It can have fat in it. And sometimes the fat is abundant. And, um, and, you know, spindle cell lipoma, I, I didn't put one in for today, but um, they, you know, even though we call them lipomas, they're probably actually a fibroblastic tumor that happens to grow a lot of fat in it or incorporate fat into it. So that's why, that's why we can have spindle cell lipomas that are low fat or no fat even. And that's why we can have overlap with these other fibroblastic and myofibroblastic tumors, because they probably all the, the primary cell is the, the spindled fibroblast or myofibroblastic cell. The, the things that help me a little bit in separating this entity out from spindle cell lipoma is I feel like you tend to have much more prominent collagen bundles like you described very nicely. You tend to have a um, the, the groups and clusters of cells really line up d dramatically in between these bundles. And to me, what it gives you, the, the word that resonates with me is this kind of zigzagging shape. Like it's like the, they go back and forth in these real sharp lines that interconnect together in this kind of zigzagging of the fascicles and, and palisades of bland spindle cells with a bit of myxoid background in between these thick bundles of, of dense uh, collagen, that's the very characteristic look. And RB1 will be lost, CD34 is usually positive. The one big difference on immunostain is Desmond is usually expressed uh, pretty abundantly. So the co-expression of 34 and Desmond here um, is a pretty common finding. Although spindle cell lipomas can have a little bit of Desmond. And again, it's kind of where do you draw the line about how to so separate these entities? It doesn't really matter. They're benign and they're, they are probably closely related entities. So this is another entity that, that was initially thought to be um, in the, the breast of older men. And now we recognize also occurs in women, probably about equally to men, and also can occur in other sites, which is why we call it mammary type myofibroblastoma, because it's, it's found in other sites. I think the last one I saw was like actually from the upper back. It was like a good site for spindle cell lipoma, but it really had this dramatic zigzag look and a lot of Desmond expression. And it was pretty big. That one was like eight or 10 centimeters. They thought it was a sarcoma clinically, and thankfully it was not. So these are benign and they are usually cured by simple excision and they're good to know for breast pathology because they do occur in, in female breasts and they get detected because of breast screening and mammography. So you, you do tend to see them in, in women because they get detected. Whereas I think in men, a lot of times they present in, in older patients once they've kind of grown enough that they present as a mass. So in the, here's kind of, again, that like kind of vague palisading that parallel array packeting kind of look where the cells are kind of vaguely like hanging out with each other um but um but not like perfectly lined up like a um like a schwannoma would be so uh again another entity in the rb1 family um uh which that's not like an official family but i i kind of think of it as a useful term or a useful grouping of these of these um, tumors because you can kind of they all have these similar overlapping features all right, so mammary type myofibroblastoma, really good. They don't always have this dramatic of collagen, but th I thought this is just such a perfect classic one. I couldn't, couldn't help but uh, share it. And again, they could also sometimes have dilated vessels and could, could potentially mimic solitary fibrous tumor also, and STAT6 would easily solve that problem in that case. Okay, great. Uh, case four. A 40-year-old man with a periungual papule on the finger and we've got an immunostain here, uh, CD34. I'll show you, well, I'll show you this uh, first. All right, look at that. Those histotechs were amazing. They laid out every little bit of that, just side by side, perfect section. I mean, with only the tiniest little bit of defect. So if you're a histotech watching this, you guys are rock stars and you make my life possible. Thank you. All right, who would like to take this one? I can do this one. I think we are in the nail and the nail bed region. Uh, and uh, I saw a poorly circumscribed nodule, uh, mainly in the dermis, and at other places it was invading into the subcutaneous yeah. fat. And right uh, always it, look yeah. at the whole slide on low power, right? Because sometimes we'll get a little extra fragment off to the side yeah. that can tell us some real important clues, and it's definitely easy to overlook that. But you, you uh, didn't fall for that trick. Good job. 
these nodules were composed of uh, these nodules were moderately cellular composed of spindle cells and at some places they were stellate they are arranged in uh, sheets and small fascicles uh, the uh, i did not see much atp in these spindle cells not very mitotically active in the background there were some exoid areas some collagenous areas and some blood vessels uh, and also some mast cells good uh, and since CD34 was positive and considering the location and histology, I think this was good for a superficial lateral fibromyxoma. Very good. And here's the CD34. Then we'll go back to the H&E. Dramatically, strikingly positive for CD34. And, you know, like I think, uh, you know, we've talked about multiple entities today that are CD34 positive. CD34, it's not, it's not bad like Vimentin, which to me is like totally worthless, as you probably know if you've watched any of my online content. I am not a big fan of Vimentin. It just doesn't ever change the diagnosis or, or help diagnostically, in my opinion, in modern soft tissue pathology. So I just don't use it. CD34 is, is relatively nonspecific, but it is, it is a very sensitive marker of certain things. So I do find it useful, but in very select contexts. Um, so here, look, the, the 34 just really strikingly highlights these cells. And you can really see this very like kind of whirling and swirling pattern in some places. Where is the, there's a good place somewhere over here I wanted to point out. Yeah, there's a, a kind of a swirling and whirling pattern that you could see in other things. So I want, you know, what else might be in your differential here? You're right. This is a superficial acral fibromyxoma, also referred to as digital fibromyxoma. Again, yet another entity that uh, Dr. Laskin has published about. I promise I didn't plan this when I picked these slides. Um, but uh, anyway, so what else would you potentially worry about here? we got CD34 swirling and whirling growth. So the, the thing I would worry a little bit about and, and did worry about in this case is dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans because it's bland, swirling mm -hmm. kind of uh, spindle cells with um, infiltration um, and entrapment or potentially it looks like infiltration and entrapment of adipocytes, right? So this kind of mm -hmm. looks like similar to the islands of stranded adipocytes that are, it can be seen in DFSP. And so, D and DFSP can, um, it's, it's rare, but it can occur on acral surfaces occasionally. So um, I was pretty sure that this wasn't, but I actually did send it for fish uh, because I wanted to be sure. Because the big difference, I mean, a lot of people recommend that you, you completely excise superficial acral fibromyxoma because they can recur. And I think recurrence is, is actually more common in pretty much any spindle cell tumor on the hands and feet, just because the surgeon goes in there and they try to just take out as little as possible so that they don't cause morbidity. So I feel like spindle cell tumors on acral surfaces tend to have a higher rate of recurrence. It's just like a, a general theme. So people say to excise these, but you don't need to like aggressively excise them with a wide margin like you would generally do with a DFSP. So, you know, if you make a DFSP diagnosis on the finger, you know, you might end up with an amputation. So a lot rides on that. So, and they can have mixoid change. So I did send it and it was negative for collagen 1A1 PDGFB. And this one showed loss of RV1 by fish. So I, I think I'm pretty sure that I did fish in this one. I didn't have access to the immunostain yet. This was some years ago. And um, so this is now more recently, we recognize that this entity is another one that has RV1 loss, CD34 positive. It can have some palisades and spindle cells and mixoid change like the other entities that we talked about, the spindle cell lipoma uh, family, cellular angiofibroma, mammary type myofibroblastoma, and now this, and they all have these overlapping features and RV1 loss. Now, this one is a lot more fascicular than a lot of the, the examples. And you might even argue, and in fact, I even thought about, this looks a lot like spindle cell lipoma. And in fact, before I knew about RV1 loss in this entity, because I, I can't remember what year that was described in, but it was relatively recent, I, since I left training, I believe. Um, and uh, so, so I had seen things before that looked like spindle cell lipoma in the hands and feet, and I thought, gosh, does it make sense to be a spindle cell lipoma here? But now I recognize probably what those were, were, were acral fibromyxomas. So I think the, the new WHO calls them acral fibromyxoma, but the other names that have been used, I think Dr. Laskin's term was superficial acral fibromyxoma. And um, Dr. Fletcher has proposed the alternative name of digital fibromyxoma because they usually are on the digit um, and oftentimes near the nail, periungual. Occasionally they can, can invade kind of deeply because remember bone and soft tissue and skin is all very close together. 
together in the digits. And so um, I have seen uh, one case that did invade down into the phalanx bone, um, and that's been described. And even still, it's they're still benign, but again, they can sometimes have local local uh, infiltration. So I feel like a lot of times these are going to be less cellular and more mixoid, have like a loose mixoid background with prominent vessels and kind of floating little stellate bland cells. Occasionally they can have some pleomorphism, but other times they're going to be more cellular like this. So I think as a general rule, you see a spindle cell thing with mixoid change on the hands and feet. The first thing you should think of if it's a bland spindle cell thing with mixoid change think about superficial acral fiber myxoma. That should be right there on your list. And then you can consider other options like perineuriomas, which can be swirly and whirly and can have, um, can have mixoid change. And I believe I stained this for perineurial markers and it was negative. Um, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while now. But uh, in the prominent vessels, let's see where the vessels are. Prominent vessels are um, usually a feature, just like you, you described. See, there's you can see the vessels here. They're not real big. They're small, but you can definitely see there's a there's a definite um, increased vascular network in the middle of this uh, lesion. All right, so superficial acral fibromyxoma or digital fibromyxoma, if you like. Quite a nice nice example because look at that, how perfect. It's got right there underneath the nail fold is a really, really great um, slide of it. Okay, any any questions? I think we're going to actually get these done on time. I wasn't sure if I could do it, but we're going to try. All right. Uh, case five is a 30-year-old woman with a back nodule. And the clinical diagnosis, of course, is sebaceous cyst. You know, I've said it before, and I'll say it again and again until the day I die. Everything's a cyst until it's not a cyst. Because anytime you get a nodule in the deep dermis or subcutis, it doesn't matter what that nodule's made of. Metastatic tumor, sweat gland tumor, sarcoma, benign spindle cell tumor. A nodule growing deep underneath the skin is going to look like a skin-colored bump. And most of the time, cysts being common, it will be a cyst, right? But there's no way to really know unless it's got a draining punctum and is draining smelly, keratinaceous debris, or unless you get a biopsy and we look and say it's a cyst. So I really harp on that to my med students and, my, um, and all of my trainees. And the reason is that I've seen so many things that were thought to be cysts, sometimes you know, the patient was reassured for years and then a biopsy was done and it ended up being a sarcoma that was slow growing or a sweat gland malignancy. Or I actually have a little box of slides that's labeled not a cyst. And one day I'll like make a video montage and put online to, to help um, highlight that point. So anyway, okay, that's my preaching about, about cysts just because I, I work with a lot of um, cancer groups online on Facebook and I uh, particularly like the dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberance group. Many of them were misdiagnosed for a long time as having a cyst and then it ended up being, you know, a, a sarcoma. So, so that's a, a topic I like to like to really, you know, uh, push hard to, to try to make a point. Okay, thank you for listening to my my uh, sermon on that. And now we'll look at the case. Who wants to take this one? All right, I'll give it a shot. Good. So the first thing I really notice is that you get this sparing of the superficial dermis. Um, and if you look towards the bottom of the sample, you can see some extension into the fat. And then when we go on to a higher power, we notice there are spindle cells kind of in that swirled story form look. Mm -hmm. um, you'll also notice some like giant cells in there. Um, it's not very mitotically active. There's also not much atypia in there going on. Um, so on my differential, I had a DF, uh, a dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans and like a fibrous histiocytoma, uh, dermatofibroma, and that's what I came up with so far. So dermatofibroma or fibrous histiocytoma, which to me are the, the same thing. We just, it, derm paths, we like to call them dermatofibroma. Soft tissue people sometimes like to call them fibrous histiocytoma or benign fibrous histiocytoma, but to me, just different names all for the same thing and then dfsp and you're right that's you went straight to the heart of the matter the differential is between those two things here that's almost always what it's going to come down to is this a df or is it a dfsp and usually even without immunostains with practice you can tell these apart most of the time do you have a preference you got a 50 50 shot um I'm going to go with the fibrous histiocytoma. Good job. Well done. Yeah, this is a fibrous histiocytoma slash dermatofibroma. And the clues that can help you. So from low power, look, this thing's deep. 
it, it does start up here in the dermis, okay? But it's it's kind of in the deep dermis rather. You know, a lot of times dermatofibromas are up here in the mid-reticular dermis and they push up close to the epidermis and you see epidermal change over them. But sometimes dermatofibromas can arise in the deep dermis and push way down into the subcutis or even be centered completely in the subcutis. And rarely they can even be like deep in the muscle. That's pretty uncommon, but it does happen, okay? So people really get freaked out when they see a big, huge DF that's got a lot of cellularity and it's going way down into the fat and there's some fat entrapment at the edges and that's the stuff that DFSB is supposed to do, right? Invading the fat and trapping the fat. And so people can really go down the tubes and make a mistake because they say, but then it's in the fat. Look, it's gotta be dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. No, dermatofibromas can also infiltrate the fat, usually not as dramatically. And I feel like when they do, they kind of like push the fat out of the way and you just get a little bit of clusters of fat trapped at the edge, but sometimes it can be more, more dramatic. Okay. And I would personally call this one a cellular dermatofibroma or cellular fibrous histiocytoma. Now, how do you decide that there's, you know, I've seen DFs that have increased cellularity, but, but some people like to reserve the term cellular dermatofibroma for when they do this when they make not just kind of swirling story forming or, or sheets of cells, but actual like really broad, you know, really intersecting fascicles that almost begin to have that kind of herringbone pattern of intersecting fascicular uh, growth, okay? And cellular DFs tend to be bigger and deeper and push down deeper into the skin. And because of that, they have a higher um, tendency to recur. And I say that with air quotes, I, I guess viewers at home can't see my air quotes. But the reason is, is that a lot of times the reason that these things grow back is not that they're an aggressive, uh, rapidly growing process, but it's because a lot of times they get sampled partially, they get a shave biopsy or a punch taken out of the middle of something that's the size of, you know, a golf ball. And then of course, it's going to keep growing because only a part of it was removed. So I feel like most of the time when I see them grow back, that's the situation. I've seen some that were kind of rapidly growing and did seem to be locally aggressive, but I would say that's a, definitely a distinct minority of cases. Cellular DFs, um, you know, people get kind of worried about them because there are very rare examples of dermatofibroma uh, that metastasize to the lungs usually. Um, and the ones that do metastasize tend to be the big, deep cellular or aneurysmal dermatofibromas. There's no way to predict which ones will do that. And I do not bring this up in my pathology report because it's so rare. And I feel like that generates unnecessary angst, just like we don't go tell every patient with a basal cell carcinoma. Well, you know, sometimes these metastasize and kill people. Yes, it's true, but it's super rare. So um, that, at least when I was a fellow, that was Dr. Weiss's advice to not you know, initiate that conversation in the report. And I feel like she's someone who has, uh, and I hope I'm not wrong in, in, in putting that out there and perhaps her views have changed since, but I actually really like that. And I feel like she's someone who has a, a real great thought about how to approach things clinically in a way that's best for the patient. I, in, that, in addition to diagnostic derm or, um, soft tissue pathology, I learned a lot about her from like how to approach things in a way that provides um, excellent patient care. Okay, so anyway, that, that's, I just wanted to bring that up because that conversation comes up a lot. So when I sign these out, and at some point I'll put, I'm working on, um, I have a bunch of saved templates for how I sign out reports. I'm working on releasing those online. It's gonna take me some time, but eventually I'll put this out. But what I usually do is say cellular dermatofibroma with a comment, these often extend deeper into the skin than regular dermatofibromas. And because of that, they have a higher uh, chance of persisting or recurring. And it's, I personally think it's optional if you wanna completely excise them. Some people feel you should always do it. I think it's kind of up to the patient and the doctor. If it doesn't grow back, then great. If it does, well then just go excise it at that point. Um, I definitely do not think that they need like a wide local excision or even require negative margins. Anecdotally, if you remove the bulk of the tumor, usually they're not going to grow back. Okay. So now what about the diagnosis, right? I've told you all that preaching stuff. I feel better now. I, I needed to get that off my chest. This is like a therapy for me. My wife's a psychiatrist, but she gets tired of having to to be my therapist all the time. So, so I have to shift that burden to, to residents and fellows. Usually the audience laughs at that point, but you know, in the, the days of Zoom, it's hard for me to tell if my jokes are landing or not. My wife really is a psychiatrist though. Okay, um, so here's some features that can help you tell apart dermatofibroma, cellular or otherwise, versus DFSP. Number one, the cells of dermatofibroma kind of paradoxically are more atypical than the cells of DFSP. DFSP has very thin, bland, very uniform, stretched out cells. They all look just like each other because they have a translocation. Dermatofibromas or fibrocystiocytoma tend to have more plump, kind of 
fat, juicy cells. Uh, I don't know if you, if you like that word, but they tend to have larger nuclei. Sometimes they'll have scattered pleomorphism. Some people call those monster cells. Don't put that in a report. That'll freak patients out, okay? But look, these guys, these are big. They're big cells, right? They're big and they kind of have, they have not really ugly nuclei, but they're bigger nuclei and they're round or oval. Some of them have a punctate nucleoli in the center. I don't, I, hopefully that's showing up for you. The presence of giant cells, multinucleated histiocytes, is a really useful clue for dermatofibroma. They're not always there, but when you find giant cells, sometimes even Teuton giant cells, when you find foamy histiocytes or xanthoma cells, when you find pockets of blood or hemosiderin deposition, even just focally, those are all things that point strongly towards dermatofibroma and away from DFSP. So this one didn't, I didn't see a good area of blood or foam cells, but the giant cells, I love that you picked up on that. It's a subtle clue that, that you might uh, be tempted to overlook but you picked up on it. Also, there's a, a sprinkling of inflammatory cells in here. Sometimes that happens. Um, so I think this is a nice um, cellular dermatofibroma. And again, there's some fat trapping at the edge. And recently there was a nice paper, I think by Raj Patel's group from Michigan, about when you have fat invasion, or entra I hate to use the word invasion, but entrapment of fat by a dermatofibroma tends to produce some fat necrosis. You'll begin to see some little foamy histiocytes, some breakdown of the adipocytes, whereas in DFSP, the fat is, is not really damaged or broken down. There's not any fat necrosis. It's just totally wrapped by tumor cells. And I had never really paid attention. See, here's a little fat necrosis here. But actually, once I saw that paper, I think that definitely holds true. I had just not thought about that before, but I think now that I've, I've started paying attention to it more, and that definitely works pretty nicely. So finally, let's talk about immunostains. If, you had, if I only gave you one immunostain to tell these apart, what would you pick? I'm cruel, I know, it's not fair, but only one stain. D34? CD34, that's exactly what I'd pick. Factor 13A, people love to talk about for dermatofibroma. It will stain a lot of scattered dendritic cells in the background of the DF, but I personally don't find it that useful. So I don't, I don't really use factor 13A for soft tissue tumors personally, but I know a lot of great pathologists who do. So if you like it and find it helpful, go for it. But CD34 is a pretty reliable marker. It's gonna usually be strongly positive in DFSP. And in dermatofibromas, negative, although there's a little trick. The middle of the DF will be negative, but at the periphery, particularly where it butts up against the rest of the dermis, it's gonna actually usually have kind of a strong staining halo or a peripheral kind of ring of CD34. And sometimes that can confuse people because it can be pretty strong. And in small DFs, it can kind of be confusing or if you have a funny tangential cut, and then look at this, here's the collagen trapping. That is a useful clue for dermatofibroma, but DFSP can do that also sometimes. So, um, and oh, one last little tip. I've got a whole video about dermatofibroma. As you can tell, I really like it. And so I'll talk about it forever. But you know, a lot of times you see epidermal hyperplasia. There's a little bit of it here. You often see that over DF, but I feel that the deeper a DF is, the further away from the epidermis it is, the less it tends to exert that effect. So don't be surprised if you don't see any tabling or epidermal induction changes over top of a DF when you have one like this that's way down in the deep dermis and subcutis. So cellular dermatofibroma, I think that's a pretty nice example of one. Okay, by, uh, and just as a quick contrast, I have a video, a short video about DFSP, and one day I'll make a full length one. For contrast, this is dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. Just so you can see, look how thin and bland. And in fact, you can see how these cells look a lot like the cells in some of those entities we were discussing earlier. They look very similar to superficial acral fibromyxoma, cellular angiofibroma of the genitals, mammary type myofibroblastoma, spindle cell lipoma, thin, bland fibroblastic cells, not much atypia at all. Uh, paradoxically, even though this is a sarcoma, it's a translocation sarcoma, so it has uniform cells, it does not have pleomorphism, extremely rare to see pleomorphism in DFSP, very, very rare. It can have some myxoid change, and this is the kind of fat entrapment, little fat cells completely wrapped and trapped, and look, this all used to be subcutis, and the tumor has just gone from the dermis and blown away and invaded deeply, deeply into the fat, leaving this honeycomb pattern of fat entrapment. This is dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And again, I've got a video that I'll, if, when you, if you're watching this online, I'll put a link down below to some videos that may be helpful. All right, so moving on so we can get this done in time. All right, uh, case six, a 30-year-old woman with a large scalp mass. Hello, you hear me? 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I'll try this one. Um, so here we can see a well, soft tissue tumor composed of spindle cells in which there are highly cellular areas um, as well as areas with less cellularity. Good. Um, it's highly vascular and it includes these branching staghorn vessels of various sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are very dilated and some of them are smaller vessels. Um, Good. Now on high power, I can see the cells are bland, uh, kind of plump spindle cells. I can see no obvious mitosis here. Right. And there's collagen in between the cells in different, of different densities, depending on the cellularity of the, uh, of the area we're looking at. Yeah, right. Here's more and, cellular. And then yeah. just for contrast, let's go over to this other piece over here. And you can see this area is much less cellular and has a lot yeah. more collagen in between, just like you described. Very nice. Yeah, indeed. So, so what do you uh, think or what's your differential? Oh, yeah. So I think this is good for a solitary fibrous tumor morphologically, although I did consider a, a dermatophibrosarcoma protuberance as well. But I can see no fat entrapment in this whole tumor, so that makes me favor a solitary fibrous tumor. I also thought this could be maybe a monophasic synovial sarcoma, although um, we could stain that for CD34. Hopefully it'll come back negative and it'll help me exclude that. And eventually use a STAT6 to confirm solitary fibrous tumor if it is indeed this so <laughs> excellent differential so and, and this is one where you you brought up all of the entities that we need to consider so this is a good this is a trick okay and that's why i showed this one because look at how dramatically hemangioperiocytic or staghorn the vessels are which is the classic feature that we see in solitary fibrous tumor also mm -hmm. you as you noted there's variability there's more cellular areas less cellular more collagenous areas another feature of solitary fibrous tumor. And I didn't show you guys this slide, but here's the CD34, blazing positive, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think oh. that you really nicely pointed out, it, you know, DFSP could look like this too. And that's actually what this is. This is a DFSP, a really tricky oh, wow. one because it's huge for one thing. Mm -hmm. And number two, the fat trapping, where is it? And I, the first time I saw one like this, I totally was like, I, I was in fellowship and I was like, Dr. Weiss, how can this be DFSP? There's no fat entrapment. I just showed you that DFSP. This is, you know, they should have fat entrapment like this, right? That's the classic thing. The infiltrated growth into the fat is the feature we all learn about. But the problem is, is sometimes when DFSPs grow, they tend to, what I've seen a lot of times, they grow until they hit fascia. I don't feel like they often invade beyond fascia. They can, but it's uncommon. I feel like they tend to hit fascia. They expand out laterally along the subcutis and along the top of the fascia. But once they do that, they wipe out and eventually entrap or destroy, remove all the fat. And so what used to all be fat gets eventually totally overrun by tumor. Let me go back real quick and I'll show you there is fat trapping. It's extremely focal in this case. This is about the only area and I know it's frustrating and I know you guys are going to hate me for this, but it's important to learn because actually I can't even find it now. There's just a few adipocytes right in here, just a couple of them that at the very edge. And sometimes that's what DFSP will do. It will make this smooth border because it hits up against fascia. I think this is like down by the galea. Basically, this is pushing onto the skull. Which in, you know, scalp, even the trunk is described as the, the most classic site for DFSP, a, a significant subset occur on the head and neck, particularly the scalp. I, I know many patients through working online um, that have scalp um, DFSP and it's particularly problematic area because you have to go all the way down to the skull. They need to have big flaps to reconstruct. It's really morbid. So um, the cells are very bland. And um, the, so when fat entrapment is very focal, it can be quite hard. It also is quite hard when you have hemangioperiocytic vessels. DFSP is one of the many tumors that can have staghorn or so-called hemangioperiocytic branching ectatic vessels. Solitary fibrous tumor is the classic one, but also synovial sarcoma, like you said. DFSP, particularly really big cellular ones, often with fibrous sarcomatous transformation, tend to have really prominent staghorn vessels and many other things so we recognize that that's a vascular pattern that can be useful but definitely not specific um the uh where's the other thing i was going to show you hold on here is the the um the other clue even without the fat trapping the one thing here that really is helpful this is story form look at that See how this is like whirling, swirling, pinwheel pattern. You can describe this a thousand ways, but it's one of those things you, you just got to see it. And once you've seen it enough, you're like, oh, that's story form. 
this is like as story form as you could ask for. It's like this perfect whirling, swirling, like they're like little tiny short fascicles that constantly are rotating around. Again, you can try to explain it a bunch of ways, but that is to me like the very, very prototypical example, characteristic example of story form pattern. And that's something I would feel that is really characteristic. DFSP usually has really prominent story form pattern, not always though. And um, other things like dermatofibromas can have story form patterns. So it's not specific at all, but uh, there, look at this. This is such nice story form. Um, so yes, this is one where definitely it's worthwhile to do um, stains to make sure that you're dealing with DFSP, not solitary fibrous tumors. Stat six would solve that problem. Um, uh, you would usually have a lot more mitotic activity in a synovial sarcoma and they'd be rare next to the skin, but definitely could have some overlapping features. So this is a, a very challenging, tricky example of what DFSP can do when it gets really large. And even though here, this is not very mitotically active and it's, it's cellular, but it's not making herringbone fascicles. But when I see a real big DFSP that's starting to get cellular, I start worrying about fibrosarcomatous kind of higher grade transformation. And this case did have some, but it's very focal. But I'll show you just so you can see. When, when I like to call things fibrosarcomatous transformation is once the tumor is the cellular areas of the tumor start leaving the story form pattern and instead becoming long fascicles that intersect together at sharp angles and it looks like they're kind of coming up out of the um the screen at us kind of the herringbone pattern and that's what it's beginning to do here we're getting longer fascicles more of a herringbone pattern so to me i would call this fibrosarcomatous it is a bit subjective about when to call things fibrosarcomatous but i think this to me meets criteria and they, they still have a good prognosis but there is a, a higher chance to metastasize uh, for fibrosarcomatous DFSP. I think it's like 15 percent is what most not all studies but most studies say whereas regular DFSP it's like a couple percent. It's very I've only I think seen like one metastatic DFSP really really quite uncommon but they are locally aggressive. They can recur multiple times. They require large surgeries. They are a very morbid disease because of their tendency for a locally aggressive repeated recurrences. I've known patients that have had multiple recurrences, uh, particularly ones that are on the scalp uh, because it's hard to clear them. Oh, and look, a couple of dipocytes just hanging out and hiding in there. Very tricky, huh? So this is a good example of uh, DFSP with some fibrous sarcomatous areas, some areas mimicking solitary fibrous tumor, uh, really good, excellent differential diagnosis and excellent approach to this case. All right, uh, case seven, sorry, we're, we might go a couple minutes late, but we'll try to get through these last two. 12 year old boy with knee pain, they did imaging and on radiography, they saw a three centimeter lytic lesion in the epiphysis of the proximal tibia is sharply demarcated and has a rim of sclerotic bone around it. So kind of a benign appearance radiographically. All right, who wants to take this one? I'll take this one. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Summer. So hi. here we see um, some bone. Yeah. And we have some fragments of viable tissue in here. And if we go um, on low power, we can see that it looks like a sheet of cells um, with some possible cartilage and on higher power um, we could see they're pretty monomorphic and on much higher power they have some nice grooves um, in the nuclei so I thought that this was a um, chondroblastoma. Nice that's what it is and what about uh, what did you think about this uh, calcification here anything special about this? Um, yeah it has kind of like a chicken wire pattern. Good. Yeah, this is a really nice classic example of chondroblastoma. They are a benign uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of a less developed cartilage tumor. They don't look usually like uh, like a, a, an enchondroma, which is like obvious mature hyaline cartilage. These are kind of less mature appearance, uh, kind of cartilage precursor cells. And uh, so because of that, they kind of have a bit of a, of a mixoidy kind of matrix that looks kind of chondromixoid in the background. But usually you're not going to see like real well-developed cartilage here. When you do begin to see cartilage, it tends to get, uh, the cells tend to be dead in those areas and get very, um, uh, very calcified. So see here, you can see like little lacunar spaces. So this area is a bit more mature cartilage and it's picking up a lot of calcium. 
Um, and uh, the other areas, you see this little thin, delicate calcium surrounding individual cells that people have called chicken wire calcification. A very nice, very classic finding, although the last chondroblastoma I saw actually didn't have this, but otherwise it fit really well for chondroblastoma. And the cells, like you said, are uniform, bland mononuclear cells, and they have nuclear grooves or bean-shaped kind of reniform nuclei. See, like, it's a little hard here on a scan to see, but there's like a little kind of coffee bean shape. Here's another one. So you could potentially think about like Langerhans cell histiocytosis on the cytology, the growth pattern doesn't fit. These will usually stay with S100, which Langerhans cell would do also. If you had any doubt, of course, you could do a CD1A or a Langerhans stain. But again, with the chicken wire calcification and the radiology findings, this fits really nicely for chondroblastoma. They usually arise in, in kids, like teenage rate, range, usually skeletally immature patients. And they are classically one of the lesions that classically arise in the epiphysis, the end of the bone, right? past the growth plate towards the towards the articular cartilage surface. So that's the classic location is in the epiphysis of the long bones, although they can occur in some other places. And sometimes they have secondary aneurysmal bone cyst change, which can get them confused with ABC. And um, in fact, this is like the classic prototypical tumor that develops secondary ABC change, although we see that in a lot of different bone uh, lesions. Um, and uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? There was something else. Oh, yeah. Up up here. Oh, and look, notice something. Look at the bone here. It's all broken. You know why? This was not decalcified. And I, uh, in the uh, Dorfman and Cherniak bone book, which if you ever want like a Bible of bone pathology, that's the book for you. It's a fantastic book with beautiful images. I'm a huge fan. Um, and uh, they mention in that book that, uh, that when you to the best time to see the chicken wire calcification is in non-decalcified specimens. I know we de need to decal bone, but I, if possible, whenever I get a bone case, if I think it's possible that we could get some decent sections out of it without decal, I would always prefer that if it's possible to do, um, even though I'm sure it probably is maddening to my histotex, but because you get so much better cellular detail, the alternative I'd say is light decal and EDTA. I want to always, if I can, get at least one block of tissue that's either non-decal or EDTA, because if we need molecular, then we can do it. Once you put it in the hardcore decal, your nucleic acids are destroyed. You can't do molecular um, immuno, you know, the cyto, cyto, cytologic features are hard to see. So, you know, um, and also it dissolves the chicken wire calcification. So that's a general rule for any bone specimen. Just as an aside, try to always get at least something. If you can scrape out some soft stuff that you can put in without decal or do that light EDTA decal. All right. And look, giant cells, osteoclastic giant cells can be present in many different bone lesions, neoplastic and non-neoplastic. And they're often uh, um, relatively abundant in chondroblastoma. So sometimes that can cause confusion with giant cell tumor of bone, but the cytologic detail of the mononuclear cells and the imaging studies can help you. And also the age, usually giant cell tumors are in skeletally mature individuals, adults, and chondroblastomas are usually in skeletally immature individuals, kids or teenagers. Okay. So that's a really nice classic chondroblastoma and a beautiful example of that, that nice chicken wire pattern of calcification. Okay. Uh, final case. And you can tell your attendings, it's my fault that you're late to sign out. I apologize. A 20 year old man with knee pain and they did an imaging studies and found a five centimeter lytic lesion in the metaphysis of the proximal tibia. Uh, sharply demarcated, surrounded by a rim of sclerotic bone. So again, a benign kind of um, radiographic appearance. Who wants to take this one? Uh, good morning. So uh, on low power, we can see fragments of bone lesions that are uh, alternatively uh, pink, eosinophilic, and uh, light blue to pale areas. Mm -hmm. uh, when we went on higher power, the uh, the pink areas are the fibrous citroma, and the pale area to lighter blue are the chondral mixoid citroma. Good. The cells themselves are uh, bland, uh, spindle to stellate, and um, I didn't appreciate any like mitosis, uh, atypia, or uh, necrosis. Good. And uh, there was also like on the second uh, second slide there was like uh, cross classification, and. Uh, maybe or bone fragment or yeah i think probably a bit of background bone see we can see a little bit of the lamellar bone lines in there right so yeah right. probably a bit of bone frag oh wait here let me uh, expand there we go yeah so bone fragment good yeah it can and, be really hard to tell especially when it's not decalcified it's hard to see the features sometimes good pickup yeah so uh along with the radiology uh, i was thinking of uh, chondromyxoid fibroma 
Very good. Yeah, this is a really nice chondromyxoid fibroma. And just like you described it as this, to me, they don't really, even though these are thought to represent like kind of precursor, like even a little bit less mature than what we see in chondroblastoma, that these cells are cartilaginous precursors. But to me, it doesn't really look at first glance, like a cartilage lesion. It looks like a myxoid lesion to me. So, you know, myxoid and chondroid can overlap, okay? You don't expect to see good mature cartilage very often in this. Just like in chondroblastoma, you're not gonna usually see obvious mature cartilage. It's gonna be kind of immature looking. Same thing here. The cells have, like you perfectly said, spindle distellate, usually bland, although sometimes you can have scattered pleomorphism and that can cause people to get a little worried. And another thing Mark Edgar taught me is he said the cells kind of look like pennant flags. You know, those flags they have like at, at stadiums, like, uh, you know, baseball games, the long thin ones that look like little isosceles triangles, right? I think it's the isosceles, the, the triangle that's, that's long and thin. And I love that, that the cells do, they really have this triangle shape to them. See how they kind of are flat at one end and then they're long and pointed at the other. So ever since he pointed that out, I think that's actually a really helpful feature, the triangle shaped cells and they're hypocellular in the middle with a lot of myxoid and sometimes kind of pink sclerotic collagen or kind of more pink dense matrix um, in the background. And then look from low power, and it's hard to tell a lot of times in curette, curette specimens, right? But look at this, there's a vague multilobularity where you have hypocellularity in the middle and look at the periphery, more cellular. So there's this kind of vague pseudo lobulation where you have less cellular zones in the middle and then those areas get more compressed and cellular at the periphery. And again, when you when you get fragments, you kind of have to you have to think a, a little bit outside the box because it's hard with curette fragments. But again, hypocellular and then a, a band of cellularity. Hypocellular here, hy uh, hypercellular over at the edge. Same thing on this piece, low cellularity, higher cellularity. I find that finding to be, that plus the cytologic features to be very, very helpful. And I've mentioned before, and it goes without saying, I think with bone pathology, you always, always have to have radiology to go with it, or you can make a huge, terrible mistake because there are things on small biopsies in bone. It has to make sense with the location, the age, and the radiology with what you're seeing pathologically. So always get that. And you know, if it's a radiologist that doesn't have a lot of familiarity, just like bone and soft tissue pathology, some pathologists have a lot of experience, some do not. Same thing for radiology. Just because they look at bones all day, um, some of them, doesn't mean that they aren't seeing a lot of bone tumors. So if in doubt, you can get a second opinion consult from someone who has experience with bone radiology. And that can be really helpful. It's priceless to have a good musculoskeletal radiologist look at the scans and the imaging when you have a difficult case. So in any case, I think this is a really nice, very characteristic example of chondromyxoid fibroma. These are benign, they can recur locally, but they're benign. And um, uh, sometimes, I've not seen one of these, but supposedly they sometimes can have uh, very closely overlapping features with chondroblastoma. So you can have lesions that have kind of hybrid features. I've not personally seen one of those, but these are pretty rare. I've only seen a handful of these in my whole career. Um, in fact, I, I one time saw two on the same day from two partners who were orthopedic surgeons, and I sent both of them out and, and thankfully, my, my, uh, uh, the experts I sent them to agreed, but I thought the surgeons will never believe me that I made this ultra rare diagnosis twice on the same day. It, I couldn't believe it. I, I had like self-doubt. I was like, there's no way these can both be the same ultra rare thing showing up the same day. It was crazy and wild. So in any case, um, chondromyxoid fibroma. And guys, we went over by eight minutes. My apologies, but I hope you enjoyed those eight cases. And you all did a fantastic job at approaching these at, um, at your differential diagnosis and workup. I mean, well done to all of you. Bravo. I really, um, really impressed. Very good work. Uh, awesome Yale pathology residents. Um, any last questions before we go? Okay. Well, I will uh, talk to you guys later. And for anyone online, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll put links to the digital slides um, in the video description down below. Have a good day.